Rather than introduce each of them individually uh, as they speak, let me say that then just a word or two about each of them in advance and then turn the floor over to them so that they may tell you uh, something about the composition of their new book, uh, about the Boston Fire Historical Society, and about the history of firefighting in Boston. Speaking in the following order, therefore, will be Stephanie Shoro, a writer and reporter living in Medford, She's the author of the seminal study, uh, Boston on Fire, A History of Firefighting in Boston, and the Coconut Grove Fire. Her newest book, The Crime of the Century, How the Brinks Robbers Stole Millions and the Hearts of Boston, has just been published by Commonwealth Editions, and copies of all these books are on sale downstairs in our museum shop. Ted Gerber is an independent uh, insurance and investment broker living in Somerville. Born and raised in Boston, he developed an admiration for the Boston Fire Department at an early age and later became interested in the department's history. He's a member of various fire service support organizations. He's the past chair of the Boston Fire Museum and is the founder and current president of the Boston Fire Historical Society. And finally, Paul Christian, retired two years ago as fire commissioner and chief of the Boston Fire Department after 38 years of service. Over those years, he held all ranks, attaining the position of deputy fire chief earlier in his career than any member of the department's history. He was awarded the Roll of Merit and Distinguished Service Award for rescues in 1971 and 1972. He was appointed Chief of the Department in 2000 and Fire Commissioner in 2001. During his administration, he established the Special Operations Division to deal with technical rescue, hazardous material, and terrorist response procedures, and he's currently the Vice President of the Boston Fire History Society. Please join me in welcoming, therefore, Stephanie Shiro, Ted Gerber, and Paul Christian. Uh, good evening. Um, I want to thank you all for being here and showing great interest in this topic. Thanks. Um, it's gratifying to see so many people uh, taking an interest um, in this particular project that we've completed uh, in recent months. First of all, let me say uh, we're honored to be in this historic building as guests of the Bostonian Society, and it is entirely appropriate that we be here, not only for the reasons that uh, Brian LeMay stated, that is that there were many fires in this building, but also on a personal note, Brian was very generous with his time and his coaching in the development of this organization, and he was of great help to me uh, over the months prior to the founding of it. So, Brian, thank you very much. Your contribution is, I just want to acknowledge that. Um, so, uh, I, as well, I want to acknowledge another gentleman and his wife who couldn't be here today, the architect who was very instrumental in the restoration of this building, Don Talalian and his wife, Barbara, uh, who together gave, also gave me a lot of coaching and the impetus to, to found this organization, which I hope will be headed for years and years of su success. So what are we all about? First of all, let me just say that the people of Boston always have demonstrated and, and shown an interest in the uh, in the, in the uh, uh, demonstrate an interest and admiration for the Boston Fire Department. As a matter of fact, so have people well beyond the borders of this city and this state. The sub, for some reason, the, the subject of the Boston Fire Department grabs the attention of people throughout the country and even the world. It's, it's, it is a legend. Uh, as, as Brian mentioned, as a kid, I grew up in Boston. Uh, I was always impressed by the resourcefulness and the bravery of the Boston firemen. I lived in a, in a very congested and flammable neighborhood, Roxbury, and the fire department's presence was always, was always very visible. And uh, so at an early age, I gained an admiration for their work. 
in recognition of that fact, a group of us who assembled in August of 2006 decided to fill the void um, that, that, that always existed. Even though department uh, research uh, had, w department records were kept for years and years, they always weren't in the most convenient locations and probably not available to the public in any great way. So to fill that void, we decided to form this organization uh, to, to, whose sole purpose would be to deliver to the public uh, representations of that great history. So uh, at that uh, meeting, we elected a board of directors and officers. We, we adopted a five-year strategic plan that will um, be reviewed annually and roll ahead each year. We also established a uh, council of advisors of about, the, about 10 members. We all reflect different, uh, different uh, professional uh, pursuits. We're a diverse group. Some of us are, are or have been professional firefighters, but others are in other professions, such as writing, which Stephanie represents, business, the design professions, and, of course, the, the firefighting uh, uh, profession as well. Uh, just a little bit about us and our short history. We were awarded our IRS nonprofit designation in June of 2007, and that was retroactive to the date of our founding in September 06. And uh, that uh, flawless uh, application and early approval is due to our, uh, the, the efforts of our treasurer, Mike Gary, who's in the room tonight. So, Mike, I want to acknowledge you for that. Uh, we're uh, again. We're, we're we have a ten-member board and a ten-member council of advisors, but what unites us is our pursuit of facts and anecdotes about the fascinating history of the Boston Fire Department. Uh, I, I, without taking too much time, I'd like those of the board members that are here to stand and just be acknowledged, if you wouldn't mind doing that, and. Uh, let people know who you are, and hopefully that uh, during the evening you'll be able to get introduced to, uh, to uh, all of them. Thanks. Uh, an organization like ours doesn't uh, get very far without partners, and probably the most significant partnership that we enjoy right now is with the command staff of the Boston Fire Department, and uh, without whose cooperation and enthusiasm we we probably wouldn't be getting very far. That, uh, that command staff is represented tonight by the present fire commissioner, Rod Fraser, who's here in the front row. Would you raise your hand or stand up? There he is. <laughs> and we thank you for your courtesies and enthusiastic cooperation. We look forward to a, a long uh, history with you. Um, let's see. And... Uh, who couldn't be here tonight was uh, Chief of Department Kevin McCurtain, who, uh, along with uh, Commissioner Fraser, is, has been instrumental in getting us uh, out on the, you know, out pushing us into our existence. So we're very fr proud of the fact that in our first year we were able to complete the project that we're introducing tonight. Uh, I've got to uh, single out board member Stephanie Shoro, who you'll hear from him in a Minute. She's a veteran newspaper woman and author uh, who got us going in, in, in this book uh, venture. Um, now that we've gone past this major task, we're, we're going to turn our attention to completing our website and helping the Boston Fire Department in organizing its archives as well as uh, updating us to our, our own strategic plan. Uh, and uh, with that, I'm, I'm going to end my remarks and introduce you to Stephanie Shoro, whose uh, professional uh, 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 qualifications were mentioned earlier by Brian LeMay, and she'll tell us a little bit about how the book project got going. Thanks. Okay. Hi. I won't, 
I won't take too much time because we really want to get to this, uh, to Paul's presentation, but um, I just, first of all, thank you. Uh, it's really great to be here. Um, when I was writing my book, researching my book, uh, Boston on Fire, I spent a lot of time down in the library here, so it's really great to be back. Um, and this is a great institution for gathering information, so I really appreciate that. Um, so let me talk just briefly about how we came to do uh, Boston's Fire Trail. And the question you might have is, does Boston need another trail? I mean, we have the Freedom Trail, we have the Black History Trail, we have the Women's History Trail, we have the Innovation Trail, we have Harbor Walk, not to mention all the tourists who are, who are running lost in the city saying, you don't need another trail, you need some street signs on the roads that you already have. So we'll work on that. Um, but we think we do. Uh, we do think we need another uh, trail. And the, the fire trail is both a metaphor for uh, looking at history and it's something real. Now, a lot of people have come up with this idea of a fire trail. I don't think I was original thinking about that. But when I was doing my research on Boston Fire, I was literally walking from place to place and being amazed at so many sites where there were major fires are still in the city, still something that you can look at. And uh, Mr. LeMay mentioned the uh, fires that were in this building, and that's one example of that. So when Ted uh, spoke to me about um, joining the uh, Boston Fire Historical Society, I said, you know, why don't we do some sort of project on a fire trail? And it could be a book or a website or something. But we were lucky enough to find a publisher. And, and I'd like to thank um, Saunders Robinson here, who's with the History Press, who helped us put this project together. We were very lucky to get a publisher. Um, she took a chance on us, a new group, putting this together in a very short period of time, but we, we managed to get it out. So the only thing I want to mention about this book is that it was truly a collaboration. Um, I'm not a firefighter, and nor do I have firefighting background. I, I, if the fire broke out, I'd be the first one out the door, basically. I'd leave it to these guys to do their work. But, uh, but I had some skills as sort of an organizing, bringing things together. But the people in the Fire Historical Society had the knowledge. Not only did we have the research to back ourselves up, but many of these people actually fought these fires. They lived through these fires. Um, so this is a real history by the people who were actually there. And I feel that this kind of project can be a model for other kinds of projects. Um, everybody here probably is interested in history, and you may be involved in another historical group. And you could look at this project as something that you might do. If you bring together the work of all your members, someone might be a good photographer, another person might be a good organizer, a good writer, someone might be able to build a website. But the important thing is to get this history recorded in some way so it can be preserved. I mean, I don't know how many times I've gotten calls on Sunday night, and Bill Noonan will, will know this. Um, I've got a project due tomorrow, and can you help me? And so I'm trying to help some student who's got his work done, uh, have to get it done by tomorrow. And I try to help these people because they're the future historians. They are the future members of historical society, of future museum goers. And if we can get this material recorded in some way, preserved for them, they will help us in the future. So let me just close by saying that uh, we think this project, uh, that Boston does need another, another trail, a fire trail. And uh, we think that uh, it's something that other uh, organizations can look at, can maybe think about doing their own kind of trail, uh, and maybe put up some street signs along the way, too. So um, let me now uh, introduce Paul Christian, who we had his qualification before. So we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and thank you, Stephanie. Can you imagine five guys trying to do a book in about two or three months? It took a good woman to get us to produce and get it done. It never would have happened otherwise. I say that publicly. Uh, tonight I have the uh, honor of giving a talk that I've given probably about seven or eight years now. It started out, uh, I did it as a presentation for Suffolk University. More recently, I've given it at Harvard, the Boston Public Library, and numerous uh, groups throughout the city. And uh, I had to skin it down for tonight. Last time I did it, it ran about an hour. So I was told to get 330 years of history down to 10 minutes. <laughs> and then I was told, you're hungry, you haven't eaten yet. So I think I have a problem. Uh, actually, from the time I was a youngster, 
First time I saw a fire engine, I was in love with the Boston Fire Department. There was no other career choice for me. My family almost threw me out of the house. I was in my senior year of engineering school when I took the appointment to the Boston Fire Department uh, 40 years ago last month on the commissioner's fourth birthday. I looked it up. A young man, I figured I'd give the fire department a few years and I'd have to go out and finish up school and get a real, uh, not a real, another more acceptable job. However, the Boston Fire Department is unique uh, amongst fire departments. We are the nation's oldest. Uh, this past January, we passed 330 years of continuous service to the people of Boston. We were under the British crown back then when the first engine arrived from England. It arrived because the town was burning down, as Brian alluded to, with a frightening frequency. The houses were built of wood. The chimneys were built of wood that were clay-lined. In addition, all of the people that came over from the old country, from England, were not the best of citizens. They got rid of a few of their arsonists. So the city was burning down. They had to get some fire engines in here and build it up. The fire brigade was formed. Now, if I get the control here, Barry, will you? Hope I push the right button there. Help me, Samantha. A woman bails us out again. <laughs> I wish my wife was here, but she's at school. I'm going to take you as quick as I can, and we'll have some questions at the end if you're still with me on this one. The department started as a, a hand department back then, naturally. We had cisterns in the street, which were wells and where they could go in and they could grab the buckets and fill them up and throw the water on the flames, or uh, after a while we got the engines you could pump, the hand-pumped engines. They could direct streams on the, uh, the fires back then. Uh, we also started out having ladder companies. Each house was required to have a ladder and a pull-down hook and a bed key. Back then, your most valuable possession was your bed. You didn't want to lose it, so you had a key where you could disassemble your frame, throw it out the window, and try and save your possessions. The uh, old hook and ladder company, you probably have heard that term. That referred to the hook that was used to pull the buildings down in the path of the fire so it wouldn't spread any further. The department evolved through hand-drawn, Around just before the Civil War, we got into the Hustron Steam Department, and then around World War I, right after World War I, we were fully motorized. Uh, today, here's what the Boston Fire Department does. I've changed these slides and cutting it down. I took a lot out, so I'm going to have to jump around a little bit. Naturally, fire suppression is still number one. Fire prevention and education and fire protection engineering is an important thing. We have a, a staff on duty. Any building in Boston being built today has to be approved by our fire protection engineers. Any materials put in the building must be certified for flame spread and for smoke spread. We also are extremely big in the emergency medical response profile for the city of Boston. I believe on the order of 70% of our runs are emergency medical that we supplement the Boston EMS. We, all of our members are first responders, quite a few are full EMTs, and we even have paramedics on the Boston Fire Department. Uh, before 9-11 and uh, with the big dig and with the Deer Island outfall tunnel, we got into technical rescue services where we had to be trained to go underground with EMS that would last four hours versus the one hour you normally use for firefighting. And we had to develop new communication, new techniques, uh, rescue protocols, which now, in fact, post 9-11, are skill sets that we're going to keep our ability on. Hazardous material control has also become a big part of the uh, fire service today in the country, and we respond to any hazmat incidents, and we are also committed to protecting the environment. This was the old city when it first started out. They actually started over in Charlestown, but the water over there was kind of bitter, so they came over there here. The water was much uh, more sweet in Boston. But there were many fires in the early days. The city bur burned down quite a bit. Come on. Next page.
This is a simula- an assimilation of one of the old hand tubs that came in from England. You can see they bought them in, uh, with pretty rapid frequency. By 1715, we had six of them. 1794, we had ten of them. Volunteer fire company started back then. Uh, back in the old days, there wasn't too much for the guys to do at night rather than hang around the taverns all the time. So fire companies were formed. They were social as well as political, and they were the firefighting backbone of the uh, fledging town back in those days. This is a, a building maybe may be familiar to most of you. It's over off of the expressway, Route 93 in the south end. It was the Boston Fire Headquarters from 1895 to 1951. It is currently the Pine Street Inn. They've occupied that building. So you drive by. The tower is right now. It's enclosed with scaffold, and they have advertising on it. But that was located right in the Lumber District. We were there for many years. Our fire alarm office was in the top floor until 1925 when it was located over into the Fenway. But it's still standing there. This is our current headquarters over on Southampton Street down near the uh, Boston Medical Center. Uh, One important aspect of the fire department is our fire alarm system. Boston has the distinction of having the first fire alarm system in the world. It was put in place here in Boston back in 1852. Two gentlemen, uh, Channing and Farmer, designed the system. They went to the city fathers, and after a while the city approved it, and it was put in the first telegraph system in the entire world. Uh, Four years ago, it was recognized by the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers as a landmark, and there's a plaque uh, over in the fire alarm office denoting it, and I believe there's one up by the uh, old Boston City Hall up on School Street, which was near where the fire alarm office was located, the original one. In 1865, when the Boston City Hall on School Street was opened, our fire alarm office was placed up in the cupola of that building. It was there that the night of 1872 in November that the uh, alarms were sent out for the Great Boston Fire. They stayed there until 1895 when they moved over into the uh, building in the South End. 1924 is another distinction for the Boston Fire Department. We're the first fire department in the United States to use two-way radio in the fire service. Uh, We did it because of the fire boats. Our Marine Service back then, we had three fire boats. Uh, One of our more frequent areas for runs was up through the uh, reserve channel, Fort Point Channel, rather, up uh, the bridges you had across from Northern Avenue, Congress Street, Summer Street, Mount Washington, Federal Street, Dover Street, and up in South Bay, where it's all pretty well gone now. There were lumber yards, coal yards, and it was quite often we had alarms up in that area. That meant that the bridges had to be opened all along the way. By the use of radio, the chief at the scene could tap in through the fire alarm boxes tell fire alarm to return the boat if it wasn't needed. So that was the reason we got the radio. And in 1929, they started transmitting the alarms over the radios, and they gradually increased it until the 1950s when we were fully uh, equipped fully with radio. This is our fire alarm headquarters. Some of you may have seen it over in the Fenway. As you come up Westland Avenue, there's two distinct pillars, and beyond it is this beautiful granite building, and that's the inscription which is on the front of the building. Not too many people get to read it. It's uh, really, uh, I think, a moving tribute to the uh, fire service. It's inscribed on the front of that building. That was opened in 1924, and it's been in continuous operation ever since. In addition to all the fire alarms from Boston, it also is the headquarters for Metro Fire, and that's the uh, 34 cities and towns around Boston. We handle the uh, dispatching of the mutual aid into those cities and towns. This building was built by an act of uh, legislation by the state. If that ever ceases to be used as a fire alarm headquarters, it must be given back to the state. This is a little lesson for your commissioner. If somebody wants to come in there and say we're going to use that for something else, they can't. They they were going to move the parks department in there. They were going to do a few other things. You can't do it. It also serves as the backup center for the Boston Police uh, 9-11 9-11 system, we can uh, pick up service for them in that building. So Boston really has an excellent communication set up like that. This is a quick shot of the inside of the, uh, the uh, system up in the old uh, cupola at City Hall. I've actually taken the time to read the engineering of it and the design of the system. And anyone who's interested in electrical engineering and uh, the system they used back then, it's truly fascinating. 
In fact, the way they used it, the uh, designers of the system, they used the central nervous system as the model for how the fire alarm system should work. If you pull a fire alarm box in the street, and they still work, the telegraph systems, they tie into a computer, that goes into the fire alarm headquarters. It doesn't go to the nearest fire station. Just as if you touch something hot with your hand, the signal goes to your brain, then the action comes back out from your brain, what your body's going to do, pull the hand back or whatever. That's how the system was designed. So it all goes into fire alarm. Fire alarm decides yeah, what actions to take. Could be the three or four boxes were pulled at once off of the same fire. They're not going to strike all the alarms out and send them out to all the companies. So they take the actions there. We still have the telegraph system. Uh, the mayor made a comment a few years ago after a study recommended taking them out to save money that they were the security blanket for the people of Boston. And truly, they are. They're a telegraph system. They don't, you don't talk to them. They don't talk to you. You pull a lever, signal comes, it goes in, an engine and a ladder are on the way without any questions asked. They'll probably be there three and a half, four minutes. You can pull for a medical emergency, for a fire. Somebody's chasing you down the street. You don't like the looks at them. Pull the box. It's there to help the people, really. It's a tremendous system. Most of these that have gotten rid of them have done it because they weren't maintained. Uh, San Francisco was all set to take theirs out before the earthquake back in, now uh, was it 88, 89, during the uh, World Series. And they not only left the system in, but they added to it because of the reliability of the uh, telegraph system. This was our first radio system over in the current fire alarm office. And that's the speaker up on top, and uh, that was our radio operator. He could talk with the fireboats from up there. This was our office up on Bristol Street. Those were the old transmitters in the middle of the floor. The circuits from all over the city tied in on, on the walls there, and the uh, circuits with the alarms coming in from the surrounding communities came in there. But those were the transmitters. We used to strike them on public bells, the alarms. And, uh, again, I, you don't have enough time to fully explain the uh, system. But they, uh, in fact, the uh, Faneuil Hall bell was the last bell to ring back in the uh, 20s. They used to strike multiple alarms on it. I'm going to show you some of the uh, firehouses that are still standing in Boston. We're very fortunate in this city. There's a tremendous number of buildings which were firehouses that are still standing. A lot of them have been put to other uses. And uh, Boston uh, has a distinction, I think, that the uh, architecture is really terrific. The, uh, most of the firehouses are a different design. This one is now a condo over at Dorchester and uh, West 4th Street in South Boston. This one's for sale. I think it's still for sale over in East Boston. Engine 40 at Sumner New Orleans. Very nice, very nice design firehouse. And you'll have no problem parking either. <laughs> this one's not for sale. It's up on in Engine 20, up on Columbia Road in Dorchester. Uh, it's a Spanish design. James Michael Curley uh, was on a trip uh, down to Louisiana at one time, and he saw a building down there he thought would really be neat for uh, the new firehouse on Columbia Road, and he said he wanted a Spanish design, so there it is. It's a stucco with the uh, tile roof. This building is still standing. It was a firehouse until 1961. <coughs> it's over on uh, Warren Avenue in the south end. Very handsome building. This one is up where the McCormick State Office building is uh, today. Thank you. This is up in Government Center. This is looking down towards Tremont City Hall, which ought to be straight ahead to your left. This is across the street from the, where the telephone building is now. It was taken down in 1963 to make way for the Government Center. It was opened in 1929. In the late 20s, the city of Boston opened three mammoth fire department buildings. <coughs> Excuse me. One was the fire alarm office. 1929, 25. This was in 1929, and it was the largest firehouse in the country when it was opened. This was the other one. This was opened in 1928 on Broadway. This is now about where the Quincy School is, and the Mass Pike would be right to the left. If you were on the Mass Pike and looked up towards where the Quincy School is in Chinatown, this was the old Broadway firehouse that closed in 1971. This house is still standing up on Dudley Street in Roxbury. It was old Engine 12. Uh, I believe that may have been with the Roxbury Fire Department. This house was with the Roxbury Fire Department. Engine 24's house up at Warren and Quincy Street. The building's still standing today. The uh, companies moved out of there in 1974. They moved to a new firehouse. I actually worked up there as acting lieutenant for a short time. I was very young then. This one, you better get your cameras out. It's over at Brookline and Longwood Avenues. 
Uh, there's a Dunkin' Donuts right beside it, and I think it's a flower shop or something in there now. It's across from the Children's Hospital in Mass Art, and it's coming down, we heard, very soon. It's kind of sad. It was a Boston firehouse up until 1932. Again, a, you know, nice-looking municipal architecture, but it is uh, going to be coming down, so you're going to get your cameras over there pretty quick. This building is down on Congress Street in the Woolhouse District. It's now the uh, Boston Fire Museum. But that was a double engine company there, the Engine 38 and Engine 39. Uh, that area down there was wool houses, railroad sheds, uh, sheds along the waterfront, very high fire load back in the old days. This was a fire on the Northern Avenue Bridge, which you might recognize the bridge behind it where we had one of our fire boats quartered, and that was the firehouse, the building behind it. That actually fell into Boston Harbor in 1969. I had a call when I was the commissioner about that building on the end of the pier. A woman wanted to buy it. I told her, I told her, it's a solitude. It's not mine. She said, well, I called the city, and they said it's still carried by the fire department. So if you want to build a little cottage out there, <laughs> belongs to the fire department. This is on Center Street in West Rock, in Jamaica Plain. It originally was the West Roxbury Fire Department headquarters, Engine 28, Ladder 10. And that was there, and it's used as a firehouse until the late 80s and when they opened up the new firehouse in Jamaica Plain. The steeple of the church you see on the right was the Baptist Church. We had a major fire there about three or four years ago, January, bitter cold night, and the Boston firefighters did a tremendous job that night, that night to keep it from spreading from the church. We saved the steeple. We saved a good part of the church, the walls. The inside of the church was destroyed, and I understand they are planning on rebuilding. This building, I'm sure it's familiar to a lot of you, over on Boylston Street, Boylston Hereford, that's been in service since 1888. Uh, it's the second oldest firehouse in Boston. Uh, somebody said it was the first oldest in one publication, and Engine 50 in Charlestown got very upset and let us know that it was the second oldest. Uh, one unique feature about this firehouse is when it was built, the front doors were actually about 10 or 12 feet above grade. Boylston Street hadn't been graded up yet to go over the Boston and Albany railroad tracks. The firehouse was built, it was way up, and it had to wait for the road to be built up to it before it could be opened up. Adjacent to it was the old police station 16. Now, this is the new Engine 28 and Ladder 10 on Jamaica Plain, took the place of the uh, one that was the Rex West Roxbury Firehouse, and uh, I didn't pick out the architect. That was built before I was, uh, had anything to say about it, but you can see they're really not as handsome as the older uh, buildings are. This is one of our newer houses. That's the Division I headquarters downtown, the bottom of a high-rise building. Opened in eight, yeah, 1989. A lot of people think that's the fire department headquarters. It uh, really isn't, but it's a Division I headquarters where the deputy chief uh, works out of. The uh, firehouse I pointed out in Borden Square, the one that was taken down in 1963, when that was put up in 1929, it was built so a fire headquarters could be added to the top of it. It never uh, actually came to a fruition, though. I'm going to take you through the apparatus pretty quick. Here's one of the old hand-drawn pump pieces from, the, uh, from uh, an old certificate. These were in the old annual reports. That's a big flywheel that uh, kept up the momentum of the engine. And the, uh, the chrome, the big uh, circular dome there, that was actually to take the pressure, the vibrations out of the pumping of the, of the engine. But these were typical of some of the pumps we had back in the old days. Those were hoss drawn, they were quite heavy. And that was the hose rail. And we had uh, quite a few hoss, hosses back then. They were very well taken care of. This is up out of, outside of the Park Street Station, one of the kiosks up there. They had to bring the hosses out to exercise them so they wouldn't get lame when there weren't enough alarms. So they'd actually take them out and exercise them. There was a case in South Boston where uh, one of the hosses got out of the firehouse down at Dodgehurst, West 4th Street, was up running around Perkins Square. The fire morale chasing him, trying to get him back to the firehouse, and he didn't want any part of it. Finally, one of the firefighters uh, got the bright idea to hit the alarm. The hoss heard the alarm ringing, and he ran back to the firehouse to get in front of the engine. So that saved his job. This is a terrific shot here, right outside Symphony Hall, between Symphony and Horticultural Hall. Look at a Mass Avenue. Engine 33 is pumping. There are wagons coming behind them. I just think it's a great shot of the uh, hussers making their run through the city. I don't know how the photographer did it and got away with it. It looked like that hustle on the far left there is coming right down on him. 
Nice shot of uh, Ladder 3 over in the south end. They're all files at Harrison Avenue and Wareham Street and the Lumber District with the uh, three-horse hitch. This was one of the self-propelled steamers. We had two of them on Boston where they actually used the steam to propel the engine. They had a chain drive on it. And you can see the size of the steering wheel on the front. It was pretty ma uh, massive to steer it. Uh, the fellow on the back, though, had the throttle, so you wanted to stay on good terms with him. He controlled the speed of the vehicle, and the guy on the front steered it. So I think that might be where some of the uh, legends of Boston drivers come from. <laughs> this is a nice picture of a, a firehouse that's still there over in Bay Village, uh, right around the corner from where the Coconut Grove was on Church Street, and the building still stands in the inscription, Chemical Engine Tours, and the lintel above the overhead door. Nice shot of uh, Engine 7's Hustron wagon. The files are still there, right behind uh, One Financial Center. If you go up on East Street, you'll see there's a Boston firehouse there. It's actually the second house to be on that location. That was the first uh, uh, house to respond to the great Boston fire that night. Uh, just a couple of pictures of the pieces from the 1920s. We used to run double engine, unit engine companies. One would pump and one would carry the hose. That's how we used to operate. Back in uh, 1940, with the uh, Valentine's blizzard, they had to bring out the horses again. We had kept the pungs in the back of the firehouses, and they had to go around and uh, round up a few horses to get the, the uh, sleigh in operation with a load of hose on the back to keep on going through the blizzard. One of our uh, early motorized ladder trucks. Now, this are three of our fireboats. At one time we had, when the department was really big, when the waterfront was really dangerous, and we had a lot of fires, we had three marine units, and that's the three of them tied up together. Uh, the McDonald and the uh, Dowd were named after Boston firefighters who were killed in World War I. This was a, a ladder truck that Boston bought back in uh, around 1940, late 30s, 1940, the White Elephant. It was a white ladder truck. 125 feet in length was the aerial ladder, and uh, it had a lot of bad luck associated with it. Uh, when they were trying it out when it was brand new, they had it extended down in Fort Hill Square, and the aerial ladder twisted out on them. They had to get a crane to come in and take it down. They had to repair it, get it back in service. Back in uh, November 15th, 1942, a week and a half before the Coconut Grove, this was at a five-alarm fire at the Luongo Brothers Restaurant in uh, Maverick Square in East Boston. The building collapsed during the fire. Six Boston firefighters were killed. This was buried in the debris at that accident. It was taken out, repaired, put back in service. December 3rd, 1947, it was assigned over to Ladder 19 in South Boston. It was going along the curve. They had the gentleman there from Westinghouse brakes. They're having trouble with the air brakes. They were going along the curve down by where the Sugar Bowl is, for those of you who are familiar with South Boston. And they put the brakes on. The truck rolled over killed another firefighter, threw a few of them onto the beach clear of the truck. Boston got rid of it after then. <laughs> uh, this is just a nice shot of one of the fleet of Macs. Boston bought these right after World War II. We had a tremendous fleet of Mac apparatus. We have one that's fully restored in Boston. We kept one there. Truly handsome uh, piece of apparatus. We had a lot of them. Here's another one of Engine 25's high-pressure wagon. Each of those guns capable of delivering 2,000 gallons per minute. That's a Charlestown ladder truck with the Mack tractor. This is uh, one of our two fireboats we got after World War II. They were converted Navy minesweepers. They were converted in Boston and made into fireboats for us, and they uh, saw quite a bit of action from 1948 right up and through the early 70s. Uh, there's one still sitting over on Northern Avenue near the Melody tent over there. It's tied up. Its back is broken. It looks pretty sad. It doesn't look as pretty as it does when it was in its heyday. This is the one that's still over there on the avenue. This is Joseph J. Luna. This one was named after a, a firefighter of Ladder 9. He was in the Marine Corps, killed in World War II. This is outside the Boston Public Library, 1956. Boston's just taken delivery of four brand new Seagrave 100-foot all steel aerial ladders, and they brought them at the Copley Square. <clears throat> nice photograph. A 1964 Mack Rescue, which was familiar and around down post, downtown Boston here for many, many years. One of our old Mack ladder trucks with an American LaFrance rear end on, they put under it. Uh, 
Back in 1968, we were at the hard top apparatus. We had to go into the enclosed apparatus. There was a lot of civil unrest in those days. Uh, things were being thrown at firefighters, and times were tough. So the days of the open cabs were gone. We had to get enclosed apparatus. Now all the regulations require that we have them now. These were one of the hands saw a tremendous amount of fire duty during the 70s and 80s. This is our current uh, fire boat. It's kind of a nice shot with the airplane coming in. It's out for the Constitution's uh, doing the turnaround. It's red, white, and blue. Uh, before we used to do that, it used to be uh, red, brown, and blue. But now that they got Boston Harbor cleaning up, it's <laughs> red, white, and blue again. We actually have a duck as we pick up the red dye and the blue dye, and we put it up, and it makes for a pretty nice display. This is some of our more recent apparatus. This one's down the ladder, ladder one down the north end. That company's been in continuous service since 1820. This is our newest addition on the Marine Fleet. It's a high-speed Boston whaler, bought for us by the uh, Leary Foundation, Dennis Leary. It serves our Marine unit, can get into the marinas real quick. The days of needing the real big fire boats uh, aren't as critical as is the, uh, the little ones for getting into tight spots real quick. This is one of our newer engines. And we have a couple of these new aerial towers. They're very useful to use at the... Uh, Big fires when you want to deliver aerial streams. That's down at our fire academy down at Moon Island, that photograph. That's our, uh, one of our newest pieces. That's our new rescue company, which you'll probably see running around downtown. It's a sign down on uh, High Street. This is just a list of some of the big fires. Now, we'd be here at 11 o'clock if I started talking about all of them. But they were many in number. Each one is a story by itself. I, and it goes on and on, and it, a lot of these are in the book, not all of them, but just glancing down, the ship fires, the Fenway Park, the Pickwick uh, Club collapse, uh, the molasses disaster, the USS Leyte in 1953, and a couple of weeks later, the uh, Black Falcon burned. The Black Falcon terminal is named after that ship where 10 longshoremen were killed back in 1953. Then uh, some of the more recent ones, 1963, the Sherry Biltmore Hotel, the Margaret Memorial Conflagration, Bellflower Street Fire. Uh, it just goes on and on, the, uh, the major fires that they've had in the city. As an overview of the uh, Great Boston Fire, you're actually looking down Summer Street, over in that direction. We'll move through these pretty quick. That was the Thanksgiving Day fire, the remains of one of the engines that was uh, struck. That's Chief of Department Louis-Philippe Weber. You know, in some of the old commissioner's minutes, there was a letter that went to the mayor complaining about uh, Weber spending too much time up in Lockoba's restaurant. <laughs> this was the Bacon Fire, where a firefighter was killed when the wall collapsed at uh, Washington and Ruggles Street. It was the night Mayor Curley was elected for the first time in 1914. This is uh, down on the foot of State Street here. You can see one of the water towers operating. Boston had four of those at one time. One of our three fireboats back then working on a pier fire. They had tremendous uh, streams. As at a fire one time standing near a crowd, and I heard one woman say to the other, where do they get all that water from? That's one of our secrets. <laughs> this is down on Congress Street, two water towers working on that fire. On South Street, you can see a couple of water towers working there, the deck guns working there. These fires were common in Boston all through the 20s, 30s, and 40s. One on, uh, that's down on South Street. This is a, a nice shot. It's over on Canal Street. And I believe it's Friend Street coming this way, but it's looking down towards the North Station. Just a, a good shot showing the, uh, the panorama. This is the fire on Eastern Avenue. <coughs> Firefighter from Ladder 8 was killed there in 1935. That's actually the, uh, the old East Boston ferry slips right there. <coughs> the ferry used to come in. For those of you who remember them, I actually was on one once when I was very small. That is the white elephant that collapsed in the uh, East Boston fire. It was a week and a half before the Coconut Grove. Six firefighters were killed. This is on State Street down by Atlantic Avenue. If you look on the uh, left, you'll see the old Atlantic Avenue elevated railway structure. This was the collapse in East Boston, Maverick Square, Henry Street. 
<coughs> where the restaurant had collapsed. That's the ladder eight, the white elephant in there. This is an orientation picture to show you where the Coconut Grove was. I cannot tell you the number of people I've brought to that site. It's still a subject of tremendous interest. This is actually a picture in 1938 of a parade coming down Columbus Avenue. This is the parade. Here's the staff of the hotel. Uh, this is the motor back around. It's our Maggiano's in here. Fleming's in here. The Radisson Hotel occupies this piece of property here. Now, here's old Broadway. And here's Key Point Street. Here's the Coconut Grove here. The front of the building and it went down to the new lounge here. This is the main dining room. Caricature bar. This is the front door of the Coconut Grove on Key Point Street. This is on the Charmed, uh Street side of the building with some of the victims on the street that night, early stages of the fire. This is the, looking in on Piedmont Street, uh, the Chad remains where the, uh, the main entrance. This was the vestibule where the revolving door was. That door on the left was blocked closed. That had a flight of stairs that went down to the uh, new Melody Lounge where the fire originated. This was in the main dining room after the fire. What's interesting in this picture is here's wooden chairs, here's rope around the columns that did not burn. That fire did not flash over that night. It traveled across the ceiling, burned. There was a tremendous amount of toxic gases, a lot of heat, but yet that did not flash over and burn. There was uh, paper music scores, menus, wooden furnishings that did not burn. It was a very uh, unusual fire. Uh, it, I don't think it's still fully understood today. People are still studying that fire. This is on the uh, Piedmont, on the uh, Charmette Street side, the back side. Those windows were broken out. A tremendous amount of people were, in fact, rescued on that side of the building that night. This is the Bellflower Street Fire in 1964, May 22nd. Rosa Three Deckers, very well kept neighborhood. But what you're looking at here is you have three deckers on both sides of the street going. This fire jumped over three streets. 28 three deckers were involved. Very nice, well kept neighborhoods. Back then, we were having a drought. There's an aerial shot. The expressway is at the very top. This is between Andrews Square and uh, Edward Everett Square on the South Boston Dorchester line. But you can see the fire there at its height. The good southwest wind blowing. We've had a drought that year. For those of you a little bit older, you, know, uh, you remember we had a tremendous uh, drought. They were telling us to you know, conserve the water, and that contributed to the, uh, that fire. This is kind of a neat shot. 1953. You can see the uh, Union Oyster House. Everything essentially on the left side is gone. That's where City Hall is now. This is sort of looking out from the mayor's office, looking down from City Hall. But the uh, McDonald's is on the corner, and uh, so is, uh, you can see the Union Oyster House just beyond that Waverly sign. But it's a good shot of the assortment of Boston fire apparatus back then. Charlestown had a tremendous amount of fires. This is just to show you how thick the smoke can be coming out. Real tough one. This was 1967, Crawford College Department Store down on uh, uh, Tremont and Temple. Building got fully involved across the, from its Yarrage Stern buildings. Fire actually got in there. But firefighters saved the Stern building and contained it to that, to the uh, Crawford Halls. That was a famous old department store. This is right at South Station where the Federal Reserve Building is. When they were tearing down for the new uh, construction in Boston, quite often would have fires. Uh, that was very prominent up in the West End when they're building Charles River Park. The big pier fire in Charlestown in 1979. Pier fires in Boston, not frequent, but we get them very dangerous. They can just burn with a certain amount of energy for so long. When they take off, they take off very severely, as happened with the Minahan fire in 1994 and this one in 1979. This was during the arson epidemic in Boston in 1981-82. We had a group of arsonists going around. And uh, they claimed they were trying to pressure the city into hiring back the laid-off firefighters, but we had a tremendous amount of fires. Some nights we'd have three and four multiple armed fires, uh, not unlike this. A chief would pull in to a fire, something like this. He'd be waiting for apparatus. The fire alarm would call him, say, there's an engine coming from Brookline. All the Boston engines were tied up. It was really a, a scary uh, period during the city's history. Lindstrom's Nightclub, back in 1968, that was my first big fire. I was only on the job a couple of weeks. It got shot to death out in West Roxbury about 10 years ago. <clears throat> There's Honey Fitz with Commissioner Cole at uh, the Bacon Fire where the firefighter was killed. There's James Michael Curley with his fur coat with Chief of Department Tabor. 
And there's another one, Curly, with his daughter, with Commissioner McSweeney and uh, Chief Fox at the downtown fire. This is a nice one of uh, Chief Walsh. He's not covered with ice on this one, with uh, Chief Fox, who was a very tall guy, and the old Superintendent Byington, who had quite a career with the fire department. One of our first motorized vehicles, the old Chief's buggy. The Deputy Chief here seems to be enjoying the ride. This was some heavy artillery. This is the down on Atlantic Avenue. They brought in this uh, portable deck gun effect with large feeds where you could, it looked like the couplings are a three inch. It could probably put uh, four three inch lines. That's about a three inch tip on the end of that uh, gun there. And that was just to show you how concerned they were about having heavy stream appliances. Downtown Boston, before it was as sprinkled and well built as it is today, was constantly a threat for conflagration. Uh, these are some of the multiple fire deaths uh, in the last uh, 60 or 70 years. I didn't go all the way back. We've lost about 190 firefighters in the line of duty over the years. Uh, these people are testament to the dedication and the daring and the bravery of Boston firefighters and what these people have given to the city over the years. Uh, these were the six firefighters who died in the East Boston Fire, again, a week and a half before the Coconut Grove. That Francis Deegan in the upper left-hand corner. His uh, nephew was the U.S. Marshal Deegan that got killed out in Montana at that shooting, the standoff with the David Koresh and that group. He was from Quincy. This was the group killed October 1964 at the Trumbull Street Fire on the South End. Uh, that Robert Clarity in the lower right-hand corner, his father was the uh, chief of department. These are the uh, nine Boston firefighters who perished at the Vendome Hotel on June 17, 1972. While the Boston firefighters were fighting a major fire, digging out their comrades, that was the same night that Nixon's boys were breaking into the uh, Watergate, June 17, 1972. This is the last slide. This is the Boston firefighters' lot up at Forest Hill Cemetery in Jamaica Plain. It's an absolutely beautiful spot. I, I urge you to go up there and take a look at it. It's a monument. Uh, it'll be 100 years old next year, this monument. Every first Sunday in June, uh, the firefighters gather together, march up there. We have a service for our departed comrades. A lot of firefighters are buried on this uh, lot up there. But it's very uh, handsome. Forest Hills is a very beautiful cemetery. A lot of uh, artwork and sculpture up there. But uh, we're very proud of our, our lot up there. And was that 10 minutes? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Chief Christian, Mr. Gerber, and uh, Stephanie have agreed to answer some questions, if anybody has any. Uh, this uh, program is being filmed tonight, though, so that any questions that are asked will have to be repeated by uh, either the answerer or somebody else. Any questions? How many fireboxes are in Boston? How many? I believe we have about 1,800 boxes out there. Uh, what we have is we, uh, we have a lot of uh, boxes on the street. I believe we're about 1,500 on the street, maybe a little less. But then we have uh, quite a few more in buildings, in public buildings, private buildings, and they're tied into our fire alarm system. Dennis is right beside you. Dennis, how many boxes do we have? Yes. Thank you. And that was part of the reason for keeping the telegraph system. If the fire alarm system, the boxes were to be pulled out, all of these buildings that are hooked into our system would then have to go out and find, go onto a private alarm company. And that includes all the Boston schools, all the Boston buildings, uh, if a cost analysis was done, it would show that it's just uh, poor wisdom to get rid of those fire alarm boxes. Uh, incidentally, during 9-11, I was downtown at the mayor's office here. We left, and I know for me the cell phone was not working. We had priority service. Trying to get dial tone during an emergency, you can't do it. The boxes keep on working, extremely reliable. Yes, okay, that's a good question. I took that slide out to explain that one, too. The that's on the one. The question is? What is the significance of the numbers? Well, the uh, original engines in Boston were numbered 1 through 11. And when Roxbury became part of Boston, Roxbury engines 1, 2, and 3 became Boston engine 12, 13, 14. And then as the city grew, we added companies. It goes right along with the growth of the city. Uh, then around 1870, we added engine 15 in south of Boston. Dorchester became part of Boston, 1870, I believe. And the Boston, Dorchester Fire Department became Boston Engines 16 through 21. 
the Boston uh, Duchess the Ladder Company became Boston Ladder Six and Ladder Seven, which they still are today. Then, as the, the, the city again expanded and, and grew, we added these numbers in. Uh, Engine 32 was in Charlestown, 33 when the Back Bay was growing. But, but just by looking at the numbers, it's kind of fascinating to see how they uh, evolved. Same way with the ladder companies. Boston Ladder 1 in the North End, been there since uh, 1820, was originally on Friend Street. That was uh, Ladder 1. Ladder 2 was East Boston, Ladder 3 to South End. Uh, but the, uh, the numbers uh, grew out like that. Uh, again, I could talk for about a half hour on the numbers, but I won't. Uh, and uh, it's kind of fascinating that they, we kept the numbers. People from now, now and then will say, why don't you drop the numbers? We still have engine 56 in East Boston, and we only have 33 engines. So why wouldn't you change the numbers back? It would be chaotic to try to do it administratively to, to scale the numbers down. The guys and gals, we have quite a few female firefighters and officers, are very proud of their company numbers. You know, if they're on that company, that number means a lot to them. To renumber the department would be a, a really a catastrophe. Good question. Well, uh, the question was uh, an alarm going off at a building and you're getting the word not to evacuate. Uh, it's up to the, prior to the arrival of the fire department, when we get on scene, we take command. The building manager has a plan put in place before the fire department ever gets there. They are required to have an evacuation plan. Part of that evacuation plan is there will be floor marshals and people to direct the people on the floor. When the alarm sounds, it sounds, uh, depending on whether it's a high-rise building or what size building it is, it'll, well, it should sound on the floor and the floor above, and the people will evacuate those floor, the floor of the alarm and the floor above, and go to what we call an area of refuge. We are not generally in favor of doing a general evacuation of a building. It's just, uh, it's much safer to keep people in place. Uh, New York City it has much more experience than we do with high rise, very big on defending place. And what we'll do is we'll hold people in place. When we arrive, we consult with the building people, see what they've done so far for evacuation. Uh, one of the things I did when I was a deputy chief downtown was to get firefighters to the floors involved. Uh, and to get a human person onto the uh, PA system. I didn't like canned tape messages. I think it's much better to tell the people we have an alarm from the fifth floor. We're investigating it at the same. We have nothing. We will keep you advised. And then I would always seek to get the firefighters up uh, to the floors to reassure the people and take over the evacuation. It's then up to the fire ground commander based on what the conditions are in the building, how to evacuate, whether to bring the people down, hold them in place. Uh, it's, it's complex and decisions have to be made. But uh, the biggest problem we had downtown was people generally disregarding the alarm, thinking, oh, it's the alarm again. And that, that is very poor uh, advice. You really should pay attention to that alarm. I advise people who work in buildings, particularly the women who might have high heels or difficult shoes to walk in, to keep a pair of sneakers with them at their desk or some, a good walking shoe in case you do have to go down 20 floors, 30 floors. You don't want to be in high heels. You're better off taking them off and throwing them away. But the building, you can discuss it with your building manager, with the manager of your department. They are required to have an evacuation plan. The plan has to be approved by the district fire chief, and they are required to exercise that plan, and you should have marshals assigned to your floor who know the plan, they, they check the restrooms, everything, make sure everyone does the proper actions. Well, the question is about the Coconut Grove, the number of uh, injuries, the number of fatalities, and the uh, number of firefighters who were present there that night. That was a five alarm fire. We actually have the numbers of, uh, the names and the numbers of all the firefighters who were present there that night. Uh, I actually have them on another stick there. If you want to come up later, I can show it to you. I believe it was in the order of uh, 180 to 200 firefighters. The Boston firefighter had, Fire Department had a lot of firefighters on injured leave that night as a result of the East Boston collapse the week and a half before. Beside the six firefighters who were killed, there were a tremendous amount who were seriously injured and, or injured to a lesser degree. Uh, one of them who was seriously injured was John V. Stapleton. He was the captain of Engine 26 that night. He uh, had a fractured skull. He was in the Boston City Hospital that night. Uh, his son was Leo Stapleton, who went on to become Chief of Department and Commissioner, and John Stapleton went on to become Chief of Department in 1950. But when Leo went in to visit him the next morning, Leo was just a young fella, 
He said, gee, something big must have happened last night. There was a lot of commotion in the hospital. But there were 492 people, as you referred to, uh, ultimately killed in that fire. Uh, there were a number of various injuries, uh, multiple trauma. There were a lot of uh, pulmonary edema. There were the, uh, the fire gases. There were burn injuries. Uh, there were people asphyxiated who were trapped and trampled. There was just quite a, a bit. There were a lot of people who survived. I believe there was slightly over 1,000 people there that night. Yes, uh, in fact, there was a, a report of one uh, uh, man that uh, showed up at the city hospital. He was standing there. Everybody thought he was okay, and next thing he just collapsed. He had burns in his lungs from the superheated gases, and he drowned in his own fluids. So uh, it was very uh, horrific. There were a lot of firefighters uh, injured there that night as well. It was fortunate that the fire department was around the corner at Stewart and Carver when this fire was discovered, or there would have been more fatalities. There were a tremendous amount of rescues made on the Shawmut Street side of the building. That's where the cobblestones showed. There were some rescues made out of the Broadway uh, side, the new lounge. Uh, there were actually a few people survived in the Melody Lounge down where the fire originated. The people caught in the foyer on the Piedmont Street side where the revolving doors were, unless they got out immediately before those doors jammed up, there were a tremendous amount of people piled right up at those doors. Uh, one human trait that we're taught about when we're studying the fire service is people generally will exit from a building the way they came in. And that's not always a good thing. Uh, you should always, when you go into a building, uh, we call it situational awareness. You're going to a restaurant, a theater, a hotel you're staying over at. Take a look around you. See how you are going to get out of there should something happen. Uh, I'm, you know, being a, an old firefighter, I won't travel without a flashlight. You know, I got one just in case. I, something happens, you can crawl and you're stumbling. You're in a fire, crawl down the hallway. You can always breathe on the ground, usually. You're not going to survive standing up if you try to get down a hallway. But the... Uh, the, those in the foyer that night were, were trapped and horribly burned. When I just mentioned the phenomena of what took place, and I don't think it's still fully understood, uh, people survived down in the Melody Lounge. That fire took on a life of its own like a ramjet engine, came right up those stairs, burst into the foyer, went down the caricature bar, which was straight ahead of the foyer, and then it, it rolled into the, um, into the uh, main dining room. But because that didn't flash over, you know, it's kind of interesting with that volume of fire. Uh, and the people have reported, I've read what the witnesses have reported, there's been a few theories written on the fire. Uh, one small group of people is proposing the uh, methyl chloride the theory, where they say the air conditioning pump, the methyl chloride leaked out, a spark ignited that. But us in the fire service, uh, when you have a gas release, you get explosion. There was no explosion there that night. Uh, the question is about the uh, sprinklers uh, and the new sprinkler law after the station nightclub fire. And uh, that law was put into effect in the uh, establishments. It was based on bars, that type of a, a venue. All new construction has to be sprinkled if it falls into any of those occupancies. If you're building a new restaurant, nightclub, anything, you have to be sprinkled or if you're doing a significant uh, renovation. The law was a retroactive law for uh, clubs that had served 100 people and was a uh, nightclub. Uh, I know there was a lot of difficulties. I don't know if the commissioner wants to comment on it or not, but I'm trying to differentiate whether a club was a restaurant, was a nightclub, uh, that uh, they had to be adjudicated. And a lot of the people were looking for some relief as far as getting a schedule so they could afford to do it. Uh, we're, you know, in the fire service, we're strong advocates for sprinklers. I, uh, I'd sprinkle or anything. If I was doing my house over, I'd put sprinklers in it. You know, I, I just feel that strongly about it. Uh, there were a lot of similarities between the Coconut Grove and the Station Nightclub fire. It wasn't one failure that caused the fires. It was a sequence of uh, failures in each property, and some of them similar, that caused the uh, horrific thing. I'm kind of disappointed in the new law that it didn't fully cover restaurants. I was in a restaurant in Quincy right after the law took effect a few months ago. And because they are a restaurant, they're not required to comply because they're in existence versus being a bar. And I was in one of their lounges, which was kind of buried in the building. I'm thinking, this is crazy. You know, this, you know I, I'm still impressed with the speed of fire. I still have a very healthy fear for fire. And I just said, just because this is a restaurant, it's not sprinkler, it's, they should have had to comply with it. But 
to answer your question, when you go in, look around, look for the sprinklers. You'll see them, and sometimes we have the hidden ones that are just the a disc, about a five-inch blank disc you'll see on a, a ceiling. But you're, you're very wise to make that choice uh, to look for the uh, sprinklers. Okay, I think we're going to uh, call an end to the, the questions this evening, and uh, I'd like to ask you to join me in thanking our speakers once again this evening, Ted Gerber, Paul Christian, Stephanie Shoro who will be available to uh, answer more of your questions and sign copies of the books on sale downstairs in our museum shop. We invite you to also join us for some light refreshments in the preservation room of the building at the far northeast.